This recording will briefly discuss the Belmont Report, which was a groundbreaking research ethics report published in the United States in 1978. It's very fundamental to what all nursing researchers have to adhere to in order to conduct human subject research. And since most of the research we do is on human participants and not on animals or on cells in a microscope under a microscope in a lab, this is very important. So as you see, the Belmont Report is composed of three broad umbrella terms. And underneath each one of these is specific guidelines that the researcher must follow. So we're gonna cover each of these three briefly with a few examples on the next few slides. The first big principle for the Belmont Report is the principle of beneficence, which basically means to do no harm. Um, we need to maximize the good that comes for our participants in our research studies. Um, beneficence is kind of thought of as a combination of two things. Beneficence being the positive, to do good for people, as opposed to non-malfeasance or non-maleficence, which is to minimize the harm and danger to participants of research. Both of those fall under the right to freedom from harm and, and discomfort. As a nurse, I'm sure you've done informed consent for um, patients, whether for surgery or blood or other types of procedures. And part of the informed consent process is that we have to list the potential benefits and risks to any type of procedure that a patient may experience. The same holds true for a research study as well. We as nurse researchers have to do everything we can to protect our participants from harm while maximizing the benefits of their research participation. The second part of the beneficence por um, portion of the Belmont Report has to do with protections from exploitation. Basically, a person should not be at a disadvantage for because they've participated in our study. So whatever information they give us, we should protect it and not use it in any way to harm the patient or participant rather. The second big category under the Belmont Report is the respect for human dignity, which is something we know all too well as nurses who care for patients across many different walks of life and different developmental groups. So the first kind of section under respect for human dignity is the right to self-determination. And basically that means that the participant has to make the choice to participate, him or herself. We can't force them or kind of stack the deck to where they can't say no. Your book talks about coercion, and that's something very important we have to think about when we're planning and implementing a research study. In essence, if I were to do a study and I wanted my participants in my study to be homeless individuals, then I could already see that there could be a potential for coercion, especially if I gave like a stipend the people who wanted to participate. So picture this, if you're a homeless individual and you see a flyer around town that, hey, if you come be in this study and you answer 20 questions and you let a researcher take your vital sign, then we're gonna give you $1,000. I mean, why would you not do that, right? I mean, we all could use an extra $1,000. However, that is coercive because the benefit or stipend I'm giving them is far too great for the amount of information and time that I'm asking of them. So it's almost like I've tied their hands basically because they need the thousand dollars, so they're gonna come do my study. But that's not fair. That's not giving them the true right to say yes or no because they feel like they have to do it. So that's being coercive. The second part is under respect for human dignity is the right to full disclosure. And this one can get a little muddy in research studies. Basically, we have to fully describe what we're trying to do with our research. We need to tell them the full purpose, what all is going to happen to them, and ultimately what we want to get out of this study. The problem is, sometimes when we give all of those details, it can cause some bias with our study results. Your book gives an excellent example on page 81, where it basically says that if we're trying to study high school students' absenteeism and see if there's a trend with those who are using substances frequently, then people who know that 
are probably not going to participate in my study if they use substances. So we have to be careful with what we tell people, but at the same time, we have to give them enough information to where they can make an informed decision about research participation. And you see the two bullet points there, covert data collection and deception. Sometimes those techniques are okay, but sometimes they cross the boundaries into unethical research practices. So we have to be very careful when we're hiding something from participants to make sure that we are keeping them from being harmed in any way. And a good example of that is like a pharmaceutical trial. Participants are told that you might be taking a blood pressure pill or you might be taking a sugar pill, a placebo. If I told them what they were taking, it would completely bias my study. So oftentimes we have to blind participants from what they're actually taking. And at the end of the study, we tell them, oh, by the way, you were taking the blood pressure medicine. Okay. So sometimes covert data collection and deception is okay, but we have to be careful with that um, to make sure we're being as ethical as possible. Lastly is justice. Once upon a time in this country, um, certain groups were targeted to conduct research because they were easy, pickings basically. Your book gives a great example of prisoners. In the early 20th century, researchers used prisoners a lot for research because they were there. They were a captive audience, if you will, and so they, they really couldn't say no. They had to participate. That is not in concordance with the right to fair treatment. We need to make sure that we're affording everyone equal rights to be a participant in a study and not marginalizing certain groups from being studied and also not picking on people who are institutionalized just because they're handy. And that's what right to fair treatment basically means. And last but certainly not least is right to privacy. And as nurses, we certainly know what that means. We've been hit over the head with HIPAA. In the same regard, we have to maintain the privacy, at least confidentiality for our participants. Sometimes it goes all the way up to anonymity. The difference between those two is that with confidentiality, I can connect you to your data. So let's say I did a study in which I had to do an EKG on you and draw some troponin levels and get your pulse rate. I obviously know that you are Jane Smith and these are your EKG readings and all of that. So somehow I have to turn Jane Smith into code number 1001 so that I can blind that in my spreadsheet and still know that these were Jane Smith's vital signs. The opposite of that is anonymous or anonymity, where I as the researcher have no idea who this data is coming from. Think of an online survey. If I have people randomly click a link and submit a survey, I have no idea who they are. I know nothing about their demographics unless they give me that information. But I cannot connect Jane Smith with her responses on that online questionnaire. So that is anonymity, which is an even higher way to protect a, a participant's right to privacy. So those are the basic principles of the Belmont Report, and hopefully that gives you a little bit more of an understanding of how researchers must um, design their studies to protect their participants' rights.